My name is David Cox. I am the assistant dean for our full-time MBA program, uh, and that includes the, uh, the two-year program and our one-year MBA program. So um, thank you all for being here. I'm going to introduce all the other folks here in a little bit. But I want to talk a little bit about why we're all here. And why we're all here, of course, is to talk a little bit about the program opportunities and, uh, at Daniels and what we do. Uh, I'm going to go for 15, 20 minutes, maybe three hours, and then turn it over to a panel discussion that will talk about our, our Daniels Compass uh, and how that works, and then spend a little bit of time on sustainability at the end and how we work that into our curriculum. So that's, that's what we're going to do, and then after that, you can talk to our, our uh, uh, program managers and, and talk to them about uh, the admissions process and so on. Uh, so let's start a little bit about Daniels. One of the things we try to do here is um, emphasize both the strong curriculum that we have, which is, is recognized uh, by rating, um, different rating agencies as having uh, very strong technical skills in finance and accounting. Uh, I mentioned finance first because, of course, it's more important. That's also, of course, my own discipline. Uh, but, it, you know, it's true finance. Um, Marketing is okay. Um, the, uh, you know, the technical skills are very strong. If you're here for one of the MS programs, the program you're talking to is terrific. Okay? If you're here for one of our MBA programs, recognize that the opportunity to take concentrations in our technical skills uh, is going to be great. The other thing that we have a very strong skill set around in our programs uh, is on some of the areas around collaboration around teamwork. We try to make sure that, that, that you understand how you tend to work within a team, what your skills are, how good, um, what you need to work on to help become a better leader, what you need to work on to become a better follower. It's one of those interesting things that you know, a lot of, a lot of um, schools talk about being a leader of a team. If you've got a team of 10, you can't all be the leader of the team. You have to know how to, how to bring your contribution to what you need to do, how to support the team in the best way possible, and so on. So we try to make sure that we do those kinds of things. We like to have a lot of fun. We take advantage of the fact that all of you recognize we're in Colorado, not Kansas. <laughs> right? We could be in Kansas and look out there and say, gee, I can see Nebraska. Right? I mean, it's a little different. If you're from Kansas, I'll be in Yeah, I think I'll be in Kansas for a while. But I moved to Colorado. Um, and there's a reason we all stay here, right? So we have some fun. Uh, one of the things we'll do is in your first uh, uh, in your first quarter, we'll all go up into the mountains and do some team building. We'll learn how to uh, do some growth courses and orienteering and some other stuff. The reason for doing that, of course, is team building and, and how to do interaction. You'll go through the entire process of uh, uh, forming and storming and norming and being able to perform in as a team in about two days, which usually usually takes about in academia five to ten years for us to get our teams actually effective. Um, but it, it, it's the kind of thing where we have a lot of fun. We certainly emphasize not thinking that I'm only going to learn something in the classroom. Okay. You learn a lot in co-curricular activities, extracurricular activities here, uh, in all the programs. We try to take you outside of the classroom as much as we can, and I'm not talking about out on the lawn to play lawn golf, I think. Right? What we do is we have a number of classes that do international travel. We have a number of classes that, that uh, travel to New York. We had a team uh, of students this spring break go to uh, Northern California in the wine country to work with a, uh, a vineyard there that the owner is a, uh, a very strong friend of the college and so on. We try to give you opportunities to practice your skills in a bit of a non-threatening environment outside of the classroom. So we, we, we try to have this focus on giving you a chance to practice your skills in real problem settings uh, beyond just what you do in the classroom and so on. We have a little bit of history here of uh, Daniels, so you should know a little bit about uh, who we are.
or so, uh, was really about trying to get us to take that step of getting business ethics and, and uh, values-based leadership into our program, making it a part of all the programs that we have here. Uh, and I think we've done a, a, a good job of being able to do that. So uh, it, it's been interesting to go through a lot of a lot of that. So.
Master of Marketing program, Master of Accountancy program, and the Master of Real Estate Construction Management program. So if you have questions on those, we'll be happy to answer those for you. Allison has the hardest job in the room because she has to work with me. Allison? <laughs> I'm Allison Sharp. I'm the Graduate Admissions Manager for the full-time MBA and the MSBI, Master of Science in Business Intelligence.
come to Daniel is when you come to Daniel, you expect to get something back for that change that you left on the table, right? Okay. Uh, at least that's what I would be concerned about. And I've already heard from one of us what he thinks the value proposition is. And that's the focus that we uh, provide or spend time talking about in the area of sustainability. What else that they alluded to earlier do you think comprises the Daniels value proposition? We just heard Dave talk to you about what it personal attention. What else? You guys thought you were going to come here and let me do all the talk. There's a test. Come on. Wrong. That happened. Hmm? Can I repeat the question? What, what? We've got sustainability as one of the three legged schools, if you will, that makes up what we think is a differentiator in coming to Daniels as opposed to going somewhere else to get your MBA. What are the other two legs? Ethics and what else? Did I hear the word? Leadership, excellent. Okay, now I don't mean no offense, day, but it's not finance, it's not accounting, it's not quantitative methods, it's not statistical analysis and programming, it's not how to do an Excel spreadsheet, but it's leadership, it's our focus on sustainability, and our very effective track record and making sure that if you're going to be a business leader tomorrow, you appreciate the value of the role that ethics plays in the decision making that you uh, will engage in as a consequence of that. So what myself and Dr. Mayer and Ms. Jeevy want to do is spend a few minutes sharing with you what those things are, meaning sustainability, leadership, and our focus on ethics, and how they do comprise that represents what the Davis College is all about. Okay, so Donna, you want to come on up? Ruth, you want to come on up? They'll tell you a little bit about themselves before we speak. But what we're going to do is give you a little bit more detail of what the Davis Compass is all about in the context of those, those three legs of the school. And their personal experiences in teaching within the curriculum for those three years. And uh, in my experience in uh, teaching and delivering content around sustainability. So we'll begin with Dr. Thanks for being here. Thanks, George. And thanks, Dave. Uh, I'm actually going to pass this to Ruth um, in just a very short while. The Compass, as you know, began here four years ago as an integrated approach to basic leadership, ethics, and sustainability. Um, so Ruth is going to talk about the essence of the edge, essence of enterprise, the need the edge course. I will talk about the ethics course, and George will talk about the sustainability course. But most importantly, we have here Chris Stewart, 2009, um, who is working in the field, and I think you probably want to hear more from him than from us. So I'm going to pass this to Ruth. She will describe the first of the three courses in the Compass, and I will come back with the ethics course. Thanks a lot, Tom. It's like being in a game show, right? <laughs> so my name is Ruth Javey. Uh, I'm a faculty member of the Department of Business Ethics and um, Legal Studies, and I've been involved in the Compass since before it existed. I was part of the original planning team, um, and I have a lot of great years in the period that I died their results on the compass. So the compass, as Don mentioned, is um, really kind of one of our differentiators in terms of curriculum here at Daniels. And the idea behind the compass was you know, all of the technical skills that George sort of reeled up, finance and accounting and Excel spreadsheets and all that kind of stuff, it's important and you have to know how to do that. And you will learn how to do that here. But as we started to think about business education oh, five, six years ago, we started to feel that there was something missing. Um, we looked at the business environment and we looked at some major business publications and some of the things they were talking about. And they weren't talking about uh, people who didn't know how to do finance. They were talking about um, ethical dilemmas that businesses were facing. They were talking about green issues that businesses were facing. They were talking about much different kinds of issues that business had ever really talked about before. And that told us we needed to do something with our curriculum. We needed to add something to what you were being taught in terms of hard skills. 
That was the origin of the compass. So the compass is a three course sequence. Um, the portal course, the original course is um, a dual course, it's called The Essence of Enterprise and Leading at the Edge. Um, I like to think of The Essence of Enterprise not as a declaratory statement, but as a question. And that is the intention of the course, to pose the question, what is the essence of enterprise? 50 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, we thought we knew the answer to that, right? It was maximize profit for your shareholders, maximize profit for your shareholders. But the world is changing, expectations of society is changing. And so what we do in the essence of enterprise, as I say, is really investigate that question. What is the essence of enterprise? Um, and we do that by looking at some classic business um, writing, some classic statements of what business is and what business should be. But we also look at issues of globalization. How is that changing what the essence of enterprise is? How are ethical and leadership issues changing what the essence of enterprise is or should be? Um, so we, we really sort of explode the notion of enterprise and explode the notion of business to start with a, um, painting a very, very, very big picture, a very broad picture of what does the world expect for business? What does business look like in the world? What is the context within, within which business operates? Now, a big chunk of what we look at in essence, because this is a big chunk of what business is about, George alluded to this, and that is the notion of leadership. And so you spend some time reading about leadership. Um, but leadership is a topic that's been taught to Daniels for a very long time, and one thing we've learned is that um, leadership is about practice. It's about actually doing stuff. It's not about reading a bunch of scholarly articles. And so the notion behind that weekend up in the mountains is that you need to go practice being a leader and being a follower. You need to actually get those behaviors, um, get the bad behaviors out of your system, get some of the good behaviors started within your system. And so um, you spend that three days up in the mountains actually practicing some of the leadership techniques and the followership te techniques that you've read about in the essence of enterprise. And then you come back and you stay in that um, group setting, keep working with those same people throughout the quarter so that hopefully you keep building on the behaviors that you learned at that leading on the edge of weekend. Now one of the other key features of essence is one of the things that I think differentiates it as a course is the pedagogy, the way that we teach it. Um, uh, uh, this is not a course where a professor comes in two times a week and stands up in front of you and clicks through 47 PowerPoints for two hours telling you about how globalization is changing business. Um, we use a process that are modeled on the Oxford tutorial sessions. So five times out of the quarter, you will in small groups meet with your instructor and talk about the reading that has been assigned. And that gives you the opportunity to dig much deeper into the reading. It gives you the opportunity to actually get to know the other folks in the classroom much better because you work with those same folks in that setting for the entire 10 weeks of the quarter. And it gives you and us the opportunity to get to know each other much better than if, again, you know, we click through our 47 PowerPoints for two hours. So the Oxford sessions are an opportunity to really uh, think about how do you break down into small groups get a handle on what is the essence of enterprise, what is the context within which business operates. Um, a very unique uh, a very unique feature of it. It makes the class really a challenge, especially if you're part-timers. I was a part-time student like you guys were thinking about being, and at 8 o'clock at night, the last thing that you want to do is have to sit in a room and actually talk to people, right? You'd rather be lectured at. It's just easier. Um, but we found that essence really requires to actually investigate that question. It requires active engagement. It requires to actually get your brain sort of around that material. And that's the intention behind those Oxford sessions. So essence sort of starts out active experiential learning, really thinking about how do you do this stuff, not just how do you read about it. And I think that that gets carried over um, really nicely into the ethics course, which is the second course of the season. So I'm going to pass it over to Don now, who's going to tell you about that question. Thanks, Ruth. Well done. And one of the ways that we actually bridge the Essence Edge class with the Ethics class, which is your second quarter, we have what's called grand rounds. During the Essence of the Enterprise class, we bring in at least two speakers every year for a grand round around that's modeled on the hospital notion that there's something so important want everybody to hear. So this year we had uh, two speakers. One was uh, Howard Schultz, the CEO 
biggest rental car enterprise in the world. He's had phenomenal success. And when you go to these grand rounds, you see their success is not just built on numbers and managing uh, those numbers. It's all about people. It's all about, therefore, how you handle people, not only your uh, customers, but also your employees. I mean, I think both of these speakers made it very clear. So at the heart of the essence of enterprise, we have an inductive process there where we look at um, successful businesses and people in our program really come to understand, and I, as I've been here now four years, really come to understand even more deeply that caring and thinking about the people that are all your stakeholders, not just your customers, but your suppliers, your employees, everybody else in the big picture is instrumental to your success. This is also one of the themes we pick up in the Ethics for the 21st Century Professional. And I want to say that Bill Daniels' legacy also involves this notion of professionalism. It's a concept we introduced in Essence of Enterprise, the idea that the business person is a professional every bit as much as the lawyer, the doctor, or the accountant. Now, Brandeis said in his address to Brown University in 1913, doctors and the lawyers, but also the business students. He says, why are you, the business students, looked at differently? Don't you have, or shouldn't you have a code? Isn't there something that characterizes what it is to be a good business person? So we look at that in ethics, uh, the 21st century professional. On the personal level, we really dig into the organizational level, and we see the kinds of things that make it difficult for organizations to function. Most of our students will report if you do a quick survey, and many of you who are working understand that your organization is a little bit dysfunctional, and maybe a lot dysfunctional. So one of the things we study in leadership is how to make that not so, and how to create an enterprise which really is, at least within itself, something which works for everybody involved. Again, not just the external stakeholders, but the internal stakeholders. A lot of that has to do with transparency, with good communications, with organization. And so it's not to take too much time, because I know we want to hear from George and Chris, but in a way that sets up what really is creating sustainable enterprise. Because once you understand that the level of commitment and integrity of every individual in the organization and the organizational culture creates the possibilities for real sustained success. And then when we get to the sustainability class, we give, uh, George talked about this, but I teach the course as well, and we try to understand what does the organization do once it has a coherent culture to really push the edge to innovate and create a truly sustainable organization financially, socially for our community, and also for society at large. Thank you, George. Now that you know what sustainability is, let's talk about finance. Uh, <laughs> you kidding. Uh, I have to work on my hearing, it's not working tonight. Uh, what, what is a sustainable enterprise? What is a sustainable Talk about sustainable development. Did you guys hear me say the same?
your stakeholders, possibly your shareholders, are also going to want you to make a little money off the way. Because after all, it is a business. What does the essence of America One of the answers to that question is, at the end of the day, you have to drive value in a way that makes a difference in people's lives and returns some degree of profit to those who own the firm. That's what the business is about. So when you think about sustainability, what you're thinking about is making sure you do no harm in the context of people and planet, and along the way, drive shared value to those that you're out there serving, whose needs and wants which you're able to effectively satisfy. Does that make sense? So how do we do that? That's the challenge. Don alluded to it just a moment ago when he talked about leadership and culture. You obviously have to have uh, an organizational leadership that understands sustainability as a value proposition. Because not everybody is there yet, right? Everybody, most firms today are still thinking about the bottom line and the quarterly numbers. And you know, if you're really progressive, you think about what it might look like a year from now. But not five years from now or 25 years from now, or forever for that matter. Sustainability and the adverse impacts that we can have on the planet if we're not careful <clears throat> in doing what we do. So it takes effective leadership, it takes a positive culture, and everything that I've read and understand about creating positive cultures is that it takes at least five years if you want to change it. So whatever you're doing today that you want to turn around and make a difference tomorrow, think about five years from now, maybe you'll get it done. So, but that's a requirement. <clears throat> you have to have the right people the right talent with the right things in the right way to leverage your value proposition. And your value proposition must be one that effectively creates what we call shared value. And I've used that term before. But what is shared value? What do I mean by shared value? Any thoughts? Any ideas? Yeah, she said it provides value for the employees as well as the consumer. And who else? Shareholders and who else? Stakeholders and who else? It's damn near everybody. Right? It's damn near everybody. Now you have some dedicated stakeholders comprised primarily of your customers, your employees, and, and, and those other two legs that I talked about, the environment and society at large, right? Everybody has an interest in how you do what you do because if you screw it up, who do you impact? Them. It's them that you, that you impact. So, quite frankly, your stakeholders, your constituents, is everybody who may have some reason to come in contact with your business, or that you adversely impact as a consequence of the things that you do that have negative externalities that you didn't anticipate. So it gets really, really complex when you talk about the effective implementation of sustainability practices within an organization that does no harm to the environment, that has a positive impact on society, drives <clears throat> positive financial return to the organization, and creates shared value. Shared value so that the relationship that you have with your stakeholders produces a positive outcome for them, your organization, and everybody who has an interest in, in, in what you do and how you do what you do. Okay? Make sense? So what we spend time doing is talking about how you make that happen. And it ain't easy. But I will say, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Because more and more firms have understood that it can't be business as usual if you're going to drive towards sustainable existence in the world of business. We're not necessarily talking about sustainable development. We're talking about a sustainable existence where you drive the competitive advantage in the marketplace Create your value in a way that makes a difference in people's lives, and you're the person that we choose to do business with because of those factors. Does that resonate with you? Do you think you'd be a much more effective leader if you knew how to do that in an organizational setting? Absolutely. And that's why we spend time doing it, because there's a lot of stake if you don't. This is hard work. If we don't figure out how to reverse what we want, if we don't figure out how to put food on the place of those who don't have it, if we don't figure out how to, in fact, grow our businesses without destroying the environment in the process, as I said a moment ago, then we all lose. That's what it's hard about. And that's what we're talking about in sustainability. So, let's let Chris tell you what his role is. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Stewart. I have some ideas to be a school in 2008.
National Renewable Energy Lab is the DOE's only research lab exclusively focused on research and development for renewable energy, so wind, solar, geothermal, building technologies. So our mission is to do research and development on these technologies, to reduce the country's dependence on foreign oil, increase national security, and commercialize and deploy these technologies. It's a really complex operation. The lab has grown in its employee size. It's almost doubled in the last three years. So in 2003, 2004, I was living in Colorado Springs, actually working at the Air Force Academy for the Alumni Association. And I knew I wanted to go back to school. I did a bachelor's of journalism in Missouri. And I wanted to advance my degree. So I, I looked at all the programs that maybe you're probably looking at in the Denver, Colorado region. And I realized that Daniels was the best degree program for me. So in 2008, I finished up school and I started looking for jobs, and Menrel was an obvious choice. I think um, being at Daniels, I knew I was getting a good education. That was a given. Um, I, applied, I applied for this job, and there were 350 applicants, master's degree preferred. I am certain that the fact that I was a Daniels alumnus made a difference when the hiring managers reviewed my applications, with and without a doubt. Uh, once, I, uh, once I finally landed that position at, at ML, I realized that there are at least half a dozen of us, Daniels alumni, that work within the lab. And we're not scientists and engineers, but the lab is a business. We're, we're interested in commercializing these products. And my job, I work in the communications office. I lead a team of about two dozen people to make sure that the work that the lab is doing is findable on the lab. So this research, really worthless if consumers and industry professionals can't find out, it, find out about it and learn about it. So that's my job. What I love about working at the lab is that when you think about sustainability, a lot of people first think about wind and solar and geothermals. There's an obvious direct connection to sustainability. But I've never worked for an organization that truly values employees like the way the lab does. So I can kind of embrace and feel value in George was just talking about in terms of the way employees really contribute to the goal of the organization. And it's easy to feel good about the work that the lab does, especially under this presidential administration. We're a priority. And the work that we're doing is really critical to the future of the way our country is going to consume electricity and um, So I, I, I liked Daniels because I knew I was getting a good education. But for me, what the value proposition was outside of the classroom experience and the outdoor leadership experience was the value of the alumni network. When I was searching for a job, and I was one of the tens of thousands of people who were unemployed, is that I found that the value of my connections with other Daniels alumni really made a difference in my job search. I made up, I updated my link, this is one of my favorite networking service. So I was looking for a job, and I saw that an employer here in town had a job. So I updated my LinkedIn status, and I said, I'm looking to connect with anyone in company XYZ. Three people who I would have never thought to independently go up to and ask for help networking in this field connected me with the director of HR and a person who used to work in the job for the position that was now in What an I was able to talk to director of HR, and the person that left the job because she was promoted within the company. And the only reason I was able to do that was through my Daniels network. So for me, what the value proposition was, was you look, look at all the different programs that you might be interested in, like shopping around. For me, the idea of knowing that throughout my career, I'll always have not only the career center, but the Daniels alumni network to help me. As you go up to folks and you ask them questions, or you want to learn about a company, or you want to learn about the, their career path, when you can say you're a Daniels student, the door is wide open. So I'd love to answer any questions you might have about my experience as a student or what I think it is to be an alumnus in the Daniels community. Um, but I also just want to wish you a lot of luck in your decision because that's so important. So thanks for coming. Thank you. Any additional comments or thoughts?
So we're open for questions. It's your turn. Is there a question in your mind? Yes.
diversity in a team is a good thing, right? And we do all we can to make sure that that diversity is there uh, to maximize the potential of the team. How long did you say the same for the entire two years? No, no. It's a function of a lot of different things. Uh, some teams, once they get comfortable in themselves, they want to do that. Uh, and it's possible to do that, but not likely in that different professors have different ways of going about doing what they do in their respective course and they can put you in a different team for a different purpose. But uh, the likelihood of you starting and ending it with the same team is not high, but it is possible. What else? Yes? Um, so one of the things I was thinking about was possibly the NBA and JV program here. Right. Um,
less than our best. We have more blind spots. Uh, this is true of organizations, this is true of individuals. One of the things you want to do while you have time here is to work on those moral blind spots. You see people interact all the time and they get into arguments and there's hard feelings. And everybody thinks they're justified. And the word justified comes from justice or just and fair. And that's at root a kind of ethics concept. So everybody thinks that they're coming from the right place. In a discussion around a meeting table or a, a conference table, when the rubber hits the road in terms of what the company wants to do going forward or what the particular part of the company's position is or what the individuals around the table think, you will not understand the other people unless you have the insights profile working on the teamwork. And the insights profile at, at, at root is honoring and respecting the different aspects of, of people and what they bring, the red color, the yellow color, the green, the blue, and I won't try to describe them, it's not my field, but the blue observer or the green or the yellow charismatic, or the red uh, fiery leader. I mean, they all have their place around the table, but God forbid there's a table full of red people. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that's not diversity. As George was saying, we try to, to get people in a mix. You mentioned diversity. What we find in ethics is that people come at a given situation with very different ideas and perspectives. It really helps to unpack where people are coming from emotionally, philosophically, that's where the ethics come in, to realize that someone may be an out-and-out utilitarian, somebody else might emphasize rights, somebody else might emphasize social contract, somebody else might be coming from a virtue perspective. All these are valid perspectives. And people bring them to the table to be a skilled leader, coordinator, mediator, and even an advocate for your own position within the organization. You have to understand all this. People will act in what they think is, Plato once said, people do not do what they think is wrong for them. They actually think they are doing what is good for them. If you're going to be a leader of any persuasion, you sometimes have to turn that around. You have to recognize that there's some, some values at stake, what they are, where people are coming from, in a diverse group of people, and make that work for the betterment of the organization all of the stakeholders. Yeah, I want to add just uh, one thing. And I think it's a piece that applies both to the, the reason that we taught ethics here at Daniels for over 15 years. And we were teaching ethics here as required courses way before anybody else in the business world even started to think about it. And I think it applies to diversity as well. We all want to sort of assume that we're good people. We all assume that we want to do the right things. We all just assume that diversity is there. But uh, when you're talking about morality, you need to be specific and you need to be explicit. This is Neither of these are areas where assumptions work. You have to have the conversations. You have to actually sit down and talk about what do we mean by ethics and morality. Not just at the individual level, but at the um, organizational level as well. You need to talk about what do we mean by diversity. What are the components of diversity? Are we really diverse? This is not an area where assumptions work. Assumptions bring mistakes. Um, and let me give you a great example. Don kind of alluded to this. People bring their own values. Um, one of the examples I have my undergraduate students think about in the undergraduate ethics and law classes, you know, you, you have a friend and who you've got classes with, and you know that they're cheating. So do you turn them in or do you not? But you've got competing values, right? If you're someone who values honesty, absolute honesty, and is kind of rules focused, then you say, yeah, you turn that sucker in because he's breaking the rules. But if you're someone who values relationships, you would never turn them in, right? Okay, now each of those sides think that they're doing the right thing. You've got to have the conversations. That's why I think we've been doing it for, you know, 15 plus years here at Daniels. You've got to talk about it. Yeah.
thing to do religiously is that when you graduate, you're not done with us. Uh, we bring back alumni all the time to speak as guest speakers in our classes. Uh, and that's all subjects. Uh, we obviously have, well, not obviously have, but we have a strong alumni network in the executive MBA program. And there are events and activities that they hold throughout the year that we become a part of or have the opportunity to be a part of. Um, it, specifically, what Barb Chrysler does, who is the director of the executive MBA program, the chair of the department, um, about once a year, we'll do marketing research. How novel is that, right? And, and we ask past graduates, we ask their employers, we ask potential uh, students, and we ask current students, what is it about the curriculum that needs to be improved? What is it about the curriculum that works? And how might we continue to differentiate damage from the rest of the pack? And we take that information and we adjust it, we adapt, we modify the curriculum as a result. So that keeps us current, it keeps you engaged, it keeps potential employers satisfied, and most importantly, it makes sure that when you walk out the door, you're prepared to go back and compete as an individual. Is that what you're looking for? Is that what you're yeah, my main thing is how the alum involved in the core curriculum for the program. You know, is that an active participation? Like I said, from the SBU? Yes. Very active. Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> we have an executive mentorship program, we have executive coaches. Shortly after the program starts, Beth, do you know how long it is before we have an executive mentoring session? During the first quarter. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to get you an executive mentor. Uh, that's the process that we engage in in the first quarter. So, yeah, it's, it's an active process. Yes?
to actually just talk through the readings that were assigned for as a team, right? as a team. No, you've got individual accountability in any given time. Um, you've got to be prepared to talk about any of the readings. Um, and so one of the challenges that the teams go through, and this is actually, a, 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 I think, a really great opportunity to figure out how do you function as part of the team, is we assign a fair amount of reading. That's the way we describe the essence reading. We a fair amount of reading. So part of what the team has to think about is what's the best way to utilize the resources, especially if you're looking at a part-time program where you've got other obligations, you're you know, working, you've got family, you can't spend 100% of your time on school. How do you actually make use of the resources that the team has and the capabilities that the team has to educate everyone in the group on the material for that week? And there are lots of different ways of doing that. Um, so you as a team have to sort of figure out, here's the objective that we've got. We've got to go in there and in an hour, we've got to, all five of us demonstrate to that, that instructor mastery of that material. How do we do that? How do we do that? And so there's lots of opportunity, especially in the first couple of sessions, to really experiment with, given the people that we've got and the personalities and the abilities. What's the best way of actually doing that? What's the best way of doing that? Here's the hell out of a lot of people. And the on-script readings really represent a huge challenge because your team is going to be asked to not only show mastery in terms of knowing what the authors have to say, but how to stitch that together and evaluate it, synthesize it, move that into current events, your own experience, take that and use it. In other words, there's some key elements to how are you going to use that and apply it? And this is what we call Bloom's taxonomy. All of us, at some time in our education, were given multiple choice tests where we were supposed to, and this is a word that's widely used, I don't like it, but regurgitate whatever was said, either in the Bible lecture, or you dutifully put in your notes, and you crank it back for the exam, and you promptly forget all about it. I call it binge and purge learning. In the Oxfords, the Bloom, I don't know who this character was, but he said it's not about memorization, it's about memorization and applying and evaluating and synthesizing. And so we push you beyond your comfort zone. And I recently came through the spring quarter uh, teaching with a marvelous man, Franco Marini, and uh, we decided to really push our students in the Oxfords, and we asked some very hard questions. And, uh, Students aren't always very comfortable with it. And they're, they're very demoralized because they're used to getting A's and they come into this process and they realize on Bloom's taxonomy, you're not synthesizing, you're not being able to compare the readings, you're not being able to evaluate or offer anything of your own that you bring to these readings, that you're using these readings to tell us about or tell each other about. And so pushing and pushing all the time um, would make it difficult for a purpose and that overarching purpose is for you to be able to critically evaluate what you see. You know, someone once said, I believe everything I read in the newspapers. Well, that was a long time ago when newspapers were the primary you know, means of communicating quote unquote facts. Now, of course, we have so many different media, and a lot of people believe everything that they see on the internet. It's fact, right? Well, Bloom's taxonomy was designed to get you to really reason closely, evaluate, and think about what you see. Of all the skills that we try to inculcate, uh, that alone will make a huge difference in the course of your professional career.
that's there. Uh, and we integrated throughout. Yes, Kurt. <coughs> we have Dr. Johnson too. He's in our marketing, he's our marketing chair. You may notice there are certain people staring at me, so I think I have to say something here. I'm the director of the MS Marketing Program, and I'm also the chair of our department. And we work very hard together as a team within the department to think carefully about what we're going to teach in each of our classes, and that we have just enough overlap, but not too much overlap within our discipline. But then we also think carefully about ethics. And in fact, Daniels has a program now that we just put into place that suggests that on every syllabus, you have to pull out what it is about your class that can be written about as far as the on grace pen strikes, which means that we have to identify, do we talk about the bottom of the pyramid here? Do we talk about corporate governance? Do we talk about ethical behavior in the discipline? And each teacher has to really think carefully about that and identify those things right on their syllabus. So the syllabi are posted two weeks ahead of time, and you can judge for yourself quite easily the value that the particular department puts on this integration by simply looking at the syllabi. In marketing, I can tell you, for example, it's too bad Jared's not here. He's living proof. He's in my marketing concepts class right this minute. And we talk about a couple of things. I ask always on the first day, what's the goal of business? What, what's the problem, not the goal? What is the problem we all face every day? And everybody kind of sits there and looks at me. And finally, some brave soul puts their hand up and goes, oh, well, making money? And there's always this question mark at the end. And uh, yes, it is about making money. It's about being profitable. But it's about being profitable in an ethical way, that people plan its profit thing that we're discussed it here. So I set the stage in the beginning marketing class, the beginning graduate marketing class. We talk, we have several cases about folks in the bottom of the pyramid, so that we realize that you can market quite effectively to people who are really very poor and really only have just a, a very small amount of money. But it's not about charity, it's about helping people feel their self-esteem and being able to contribute. So even in marketing, you know, we're making all these fancy ads and doing things like that. We, in fact, have a lot, a large role to play in ethics because um, we have the ability to shape how you think. And take that in. We have the ability to shape how you think. In the advertising you see, in the posters you read, most people, not necessarily you, because you're a special professional business school, but most people, most of America doesn't have a graduate degree. They don't even have a, back, a bachelor's degree. And so they do believe what they see. So as marketers, it's extremely important for us to instill in our students that the message we give is a truthful method, message and a message of integrity. The brands we build need to be solid brands that you can rely on. And so those are things that we do all throughout our entire coursework and section courses. Now this is marketing. I can't speak as deeply about the others, but I certainly know all the other department chairs and I would say that it's something that at our faculty meetings, at our management council meetings, those of us at the academic council when we're planning games curriculum as a whole, we really take that into what we're what we're doing and try to make sure that our individual faculty who work with each of us realize the importance of this. So you will just not hear about ethics in the compass, and that's it. And that's the end of it. So now we're on to finance, of all places. Um, you will really probably, I know you will be, get that reinforced throughout. So I hope that answers your question, at least in, in my discipline. Okay? I didn't mean this. 
Yes. 